Alrighty, it's three o'clock. Let's get this thing going. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Lucas. I use he and pronouns, and I am the studio director at Silver String Media. Uh, we're a small indie game studio. We do narrative consulting and uh, game development. Um, we've done uh, writing work on games that you might know, like Celeste and Where the Water Tastes Like Wine and Time Spinner. Uh, and we just this year released our first major in house original project, uh, Glitch Hikers The Spaces Between, uh, which you can get on Mac PC and Nintendo Switch. Um, and we've decided to try out the world of streaming. Uh, so this is our first major stream, really. Um, so we're just sort of going to get set up here and see how it goes, and I'm going to play some I Was a Teenage Exocolonist, which is uh, maybe my favorite game of 2022, other than our own, of course. But uh, yeah, so thank you for, for joining. Um, this stream, I've, I've played through Exocolonist a, a few times. It's a game that rewards being replayed. Um, and I'm going to try a very specific kind of run on this playthrough, I think. So um, there will be spoilers for things about the game if you don't know sort of how it works or what the um, premise is uh, and you don't want to be spoiled, then this is your chance to not uh, stick around, which I will totally understand. Because um, I'm going to be diving right into sort of the meat and potatoes of, of it. Uh, and once I make sure that everything is set up properly, I'm going to move over and see how we go. Um, if you have any questions and you want to join in the chat, please do. Otherwise, I'm just going to jump right in here and start a new life. Wake up again. Uh, there are extensive content warnings. If you don't know about them, please look them up somewhere before we get too far in. You wake to chaos, a confusion of light and heat and smoke. Fire. Your head is pounding. You must have hit it and blacked out, but you aren't sure how you got here, or what on Vertumna is happening. There's something important you need to remember. Your stomach lurches as the floor crumbles beneath your feet, then collapses. Your body aches and your eyes burn from the smoke. A figure appears through the flames. It's your friend. Your friend? Wait, why can't you remember her name? She's gesturing and shouting at you, but all you hear is a ringing in your ears. What's going on? You try to speak, but the words come out jumbled. Your throat seizes around a lungful of choking smoke, and you feel dizzy and confused. Your friend pulls you out of the rubble. She throws your arm over her shoulder and half drags you towards the door. Through it, you see a deep, eerie twilight, dark blue and cold against the heat of the fire around you. Glow season. Glowing eyes, you shake your head to clear your vision. Is that some kind of dog, like from Earth? That's no dog. The creature howls and lunges its jaws. Oh. Bum, bum, bum. You are born on the Stratospheric, Earth's first colony ship, halfway through its 20-year voyage to a wormhole at the edge of the Sol system. Your parents run the hydroponic gardens, which make fresh air and vegetables for the ship. Like the other colonists, they bravely chose to make this one-way journey to the uncharted planet Vertumna IV in the hopes that they could escape Earth's troubles. They had you the old-fashioned way, merging their genes like they merged their cultures and traditions. They name you. Uh, so, we're gonna jump into this playthrough. Um, I've typically been playing uh, male or somewhat male, somewhat non-binary uh, protagonists, which I will continue to do for, for my playthroughs, just what I'm comfortable with. Um, so I get to have those sweet, sweet gay relationships. I will be Selene. You're a bright-eyed child with an active imagination, sometimes too active, your mom says. 
Uh, yeah, so I'm going to... I like that there's sliders even when there's no distinct difference until you pass over the line, because it lets you, you know, feel the way you want to feel about yourself, um, which I quite enjoy. Your earliest memories are of your fourth birthday. There's a big cake with a neat hollow effect that looks like fire, but when you reach out to touch it, all you get is a handful of icing. Yummy. Your favorite present is... Okay, so we start off by building uh, the base of our character and having played through previous playthroughs, uh, you actually get a few more options and a few extra stats um, for your, your character creation. Um, and what I am going to do this this playthrough, and, and maybe I'll get more into the sort of whys uh, of that at some point, but um, there's options throughout the game where you recall memories of other lifetimes. That's sort of a big premise of the game as you go through this wormhole. Um, and you can express that you are remembering these things to folks, and you get delusions cards when you do that uh, because they don't really believe you. Um, and I've heard that some interesting things can happen if you, like, really press on that a lot. Um, and then the other thing that I'm planning on doing is something that, uh, that I haven't done in previous playthroughs, which is lean in more to the sort of combat military side of things. Now, I don't want to, uh, be full-on fascist, because that's no fun, but... Um, I'm thinking there will be some interesting ways that, that I can play that to uh, explore part of the game that I haven't seen before, with the uh, primary goal of befriending two of the characters, Anemone and Vase, who I haven't fully befriended in, in other playthroughs before. Uh, all of that is to say I need to think about how I want to start uh, this character. I start with bonuses to biology, animals, persuasion, empathy, reasoning, or toughness. Now I think I'm going to end up getting a lot of toughness anyway, because I'm going to be trying to befriend an enemy who's a sports-type girl, um, and maybe working on the farm a little bit. So I don't think I need the bonus up front. Uh, I kind of want to spread out my skills a little bit. The, the game sort of teaches you early on to, you know, focus on a few things because you won't have time to do everything. Uh, but I've also found that there's a, there's definitely a part of the game where if you're focusing too much on one thing, then you've, you know, you've maxed it out early on, and which gives you bonuses and stuff. But then if you keep doing those kinds of things, you're sort of wasting the potential points to some extent. So... Um, I don't want to focus too hard on one thing when I know I'm going to be getting those points anyway, whereas something like um, biology or animals or um, empathy even, you know, is something that I probably won't be spending a lot of time or as much time um, focusing on throughout the game, and so having a little bit to start with I think could be nice. Um, and I know my... my uh, you got a genetic enhancement as well, and I think I'm also going to go with the empathy one for that because I enjoy it quite a bit. Um, so I might double down on that um, and see how that goes just to start with sort of a, a decent amount of empathy. Oh, yes. oh so that actually gave me plus five persuasion, so that's fine. That's also useful. The, the hat will give me plus, one empathy, or plus five empathy if I equip it. Uh, the captain runs the whole entire ship. She's very big and very, very old. She doesn't usually have time to talk with kids. Your dad says her job is serious business. From as early as you can remember, you've had vivid dreams every night. You dream about your friends, but they're more grown up. You dream about your parents, too, only they're more serious. At night, you explore a vast, unexplored wilderness under wide open skies, enjoying the feeling of rain hitting your face. Except, sometimes, you dream of monsters. Sometimes, the bad dreams make you scared to go to sleep. So every night before lights out, your dad tells you a bedtime story. You often ask for Tales of Earth, the place you've only seen in hollow vids. Your dad doesn't want to talk about it. How about we save that for another time, he'll say, or maybe when you're older. He prefers made-up stories. Your favorite is... Uh, and so here, dream people, st stories from your dreams. Uh, I could also do the ship engineering manuals, which gives me... Um, uh, an extra equipment card and could let me do something in the story early on here uh, to actually help save the ship um, from taking uh, some damage when it goes through the wormhole, um, which I'm which I will probably do in a in a future run when I try to do sort of my 
my best run possible um try to you know save everyone's life as much as possible and, and whatnot but um for this run that's not going to be my focus so there will be some challenges involved but i think i'm going to focus on the stories from my dreams here uh there's plus five bravery nice You've always been weird that way. You beg him to tell you stories about the aliens called the Gardeners and insist they are real people you've met, or will meet, or something. They're from your dreams, but it seems so real. It's more like remembering. It's hard to explain. Your family doesn't understand, but your dad is happy to play make-believe. Together, you make up new adventures for the Gardeners every night. Every child on the stratospheric is given one genetic enhancement. By age six, you see the first sign of yours. Uh, so this is the one where, you know, I could go with, uh, with super strength, I could go with um, some other things that, you know, lean in towards my, uh, my ultimate goal of going in a more combat-focused thing. But uh, like I said, um, I want to kind of spread out some of my skills, get some, get some things early on that I won't be spending a lot of time training in uh, later. So I'm going to go with Calm Temperament. I also like it because it has this card that uh, gives you less stress, and so you can sometimes do a little bit more before having to uh, to rest for a while. And there's my 10 empathy. Nothing can phase you. You're rarely frustrated, and you don't let anxiety get the better of you. You brush insults aside, always play nice, and never have to be told that sharing is caring. You're especially nice to your friend. Uh, so again, um, in this case, I'm going to pick Dis. This is one of my favorite uh, of the NPCs. He was the first person uh, I romanced playing through. Um, but one of the reasons that I want to pick uh, friendship with this is because you get extra friendship points with them to start with. And if you can be friends with this early on, then you get access to exploring outside of the colony um, quite a bit earlier than you might otherwise be able to do. And I definitely will want to be doing some of that. Uh, so I'm going to start with this. Also gives me some perception and more bravery, which is also useful. Dis loves to find places on the ship that nobody else knows about. He's smaller than the other kids, so he can get up into the bulkheads. You know where he likes to go when he wants to be alone. The lights are dimmed for the night cycle when you realize that you didn't see Dis at dinner, or at the crash holovid night. Antecedent, I love that name, uh, Antecedent must have realized too. She's constantly checking her hollow palm and anxiously typing messages. The light is distracting you from the hollow vid. This is Sister Tangent is not worried. She says he always does this. You know that's true, but skipping dinner? Maybe something's wrong. Uh, so I'm gonna go find him. I'm gonna hang out with this. We find him curled up in the empty storage closet beside the compost nutrient extraction room. It actually smells really nice, like freshly crushed tomato leaves. That is a good smell. He grudgingly agrees to come back to the crash. Something must have happened to make him quieter than usual, but he doesn't want to talk about it. You're ten years old and the ship finally reaches the wormhole. Professor Hal says it's like a doorway to other star systems, with the planet Retumina 4 on the other side. You run emergency drills for months to prepare. When the day finally comes, it starts with a rumble, then things start to slide off the tables. You hurry to gather near the escape pods, just in case. Single file, everyone, Professor Hal instructs you to follow him. You've dreamed of this day since you were in diapers. It's one of your earliest memories, even though it hasn't happened yet. As the ship passes through the wormhole, the shields will fail. If you don't recalibrate them, your parents' hydroponic farms will be lost, which is going to be a problem. Uh, however, I don't know how to recalibrate the shields uh, in this playthrough because of the choices that I've already picked. Uh, and so I think I'm going to try to slip away, be a little rebellious. Maybe this is as well. Professor Hal grabs you by the scruff of your neck. Nope, sorry, Selene, there is no time to play around. You'll have to come with the rest of the class. So much for that. The emergency area is crowded with families. It's going to be fine, Selene, your dad suits. We'll be through the wormhole and down on the planet before you know it, just like we've practiced. Your mom gives him a sharp, worried look. Red emergency lights switch on as a siren begins to sound somewhere distant in the ship. You try to breathe slowly like you were taught, but you're very scared. You look out a porthole. The stars are gone. When you're frightened, you... To try to be brave for others, since my bravery is... <laughs> uh, good. Tough face. Get in touch with your emotions, uh, because I have the empathy. Stress cry. 
which I like, but this, uh, or find a distraction, which I can't do because I don't have uh, organizing. Try to be brave for others. I do think I'm going to pick that one this time because I want to get some better, uh, some good red cards because I'm going to be doing a lot of red challenges. Sometimes you pretend to be confident so the people around you will be less scared. You look over at your classmate Tang and realize she's doing the same thing. She gives you a hard smile. You return it and keep focusing on your breathing. You wait. The shaking builds. Then everything starts to get very weird. The hallway stretches, stretches, and you're stretching too. Your arm's impossibly long. Your head feels like it's slowly filling up like a balloon and contracting down to the size of an atom at the same time. Is this the wormhole? You hear the distant, ominous squeal of metal giving way as the ship shudders and lurches in slow motion. The weirdest part is a sense of deja vu. You're sure this has happened to you before, and you know, somehow, that everything is going to be okay. Well, maybe not everything. The shuddering reaches a crescendo. You hear an impossibly loud crunch and feel weightless for a few seconds before gravity slams you back against the wall, head first. You black out. As you slip unconscious, you feel yourself twisted out of time. It's today, yesterday, and tomorrow all at once. And more than just one tomorrow. Lots of them. Different tomorrows. You find yourself in a place you know from your nightmares. It's the same dream you always have. Fire, chaos, fear. You're running and then you're falling, stumbling, your body shattering as the ground gives way and swallows you in a hot, dry pit of burning rubble. Through the smoke, you see her. So familiar. A woman with a shock of red hair and a look of panic. Don't give up on me, she pleads, grasping for your hand. I need you. Distantly, you can feel the ship's shaking has stopped and hear your parents' worried voices. Feeling safe, you slip further into the warm embrace of the stars. You drift. Gradually, your consciousness reforms. You wake up in the med bay. The med bed under you plays a soft tone, and an automatic, automated voice speaks. Two weeks have elapsed. The patient's cranial injury has completed healing. They may now be safely discharged. As the fog lifts from your head, you realize something seems different about this room. It's so... bright? You try to focus on the window. Something is definitely different. I love how the choices here become more and more intense. Sunlight? Trees? Ground? Instead of the familiar blackness of space, bright light from twin blue and yellow suns is streaming through the windows. You peer out and see fields, glass-walled domes, and walls ringed by giant mushroom-like trees. There are construction materials everywhere, and people walking around, outside, on the ground. You better get out there and join them. Rush outside. And here we are. Month one, so far mostly a focus on... Oh, Tammy jumps as you step out of the ship's quarters behind her. You're awake! Are you all better? You better go see your dad. She points southeast towards some geodesic domes. To walk, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so yeah, so focusing on some yellow to start with. I, I like having a little bit of empathy. That might give me some, uh, some options early on. Uh, and a bit of bravery that I'm going to have to work on as well in order to get out and explore, uh, which will also help with my perception. So I will need more uh, toughness and combat focus at some point, um, and maybe some of these blue ones like biology is always useful as well, but exploring will help me get that as well. Uh, and otherwise, we move into it. Strato Colony. Tammy looks concerned. You slept for so long after you bumped your head, she says. I bet your parents were worried. Your dad is working over in geoponics near those domes. They're called greenhouses. I would go with you, but, um, well, this is as far as I've been from the ship since we landed, Tammy stutters, blushing. It's scary outside. There's dad. Selene, your dad gives you a big warm hug. I'm so happy you're finally awake. I love the dad in this game. Dr. Instance thought it'd be best to keep you asleep while your noggin healed. Your mother and I thought you might sleep away the whole year, my snoozy little gooseberry. He checks your head and looks relieved. He was clearly very worried about you, but covers it with jokes and smiles. I, I, can't, I can't not love my dad. This is great. 
Welcome to Vertumna, he says, gesturing around you. You've never seen the stratospheric from the outside, except in pictures. The ship has been separated in two, and parts taken off to form other buildings and a big wall around the whole colony. The alien jungle creeps right up to the wall. Only the geodesic greenhouses pass outside it, dotting their way up the hill. What's outside the walls, ever curious? Oh, don't worry about that, my dear aubergine, he says. Nothing that could hurt you. We just don't want you getting lost in the big, big world out there. Oh, before I forget, he pulls a package out from his satchel and hands it to you. You blink and stare at it blankly. Don't you know what day it is? He asks. You honestly don't. You remind him that you've been asleep in medbay. Happy birthday, he shouts, wrapping you in a warm hug. Your birthday already? You feel a dizzying sense of deja vu. You stare hard at the wrapped package. You you know exactly what's in there. You remember it. No, you, no, you dreamed about this package some years ago on the ship. Inside will be a small medallion in the shape of a sun that your dad made by hand. I'm going to tell him I know what's in it. You describe the medallion, and your dad tisks as he hands you the package. Ah, who ruined the surprise? Was it Seek? I'll bet it was Seek. They hate fun. He grins and adds, don't tell them I said that. You start to explain that nobody told you, but someone shouts your dad's name. Listen, I'm so sorry, Selene, he says, but I have to get back to work. There was an accident when we landed, and he stops himself. Don't worry. We're going to fix it, your brother and I. Professor Hal is expecting you in classes, if you're feeling up to it, your dad says, pointing west to the engineering wing and the rear end of the bisected ship. Then he points to the large doors you came out of earlier. Or you can relax in our quarters until you're feeling better. We'll talk later tonight, he says, then kisses the top of your head and ruffles your hair. Have a wonderful birthday, Selene. I love you. Love you too, Dad. Alrighty. Time to check things out and talk to some folks. Here's this. You see Dis sitting on the ground beside some bushes. Is he hiding from someone? He seems to be watching the gate in the wall to the south, where grown-ups are coming and going. Kids aren't allowed past the walls, he says quietly, without looking up. They say there's nothing to be afraid of, but then why do we need walls? It's a good question. You stare at the gate and have a sudden rush of memory so strong that you think you might faint. You imagine something crashing through the wall, something enormous and dark and wriggly. For years in space, you've had half-remembered nightmares of monsters, of your ship being destroyed, of sifting through wreckage that used to be your home, trying to find something. Your dad always told you the dreams weren't real. Breaking you from your daydream, Dis whispers, I think there are monsters out there. I believe him. No, you don't, he says. You're being sarcastic, I can tell. Nobody believes me. He turns his back and ignores you. I don't want to push it. I don't want to make... Uh, Dis gets bullied enough. Leave him alone for now. Well, you tried. Dis is so sensitive about being teased. Sorry, Dis. Here's Anemone! Hiya, Selene! Anemone seems really at home here. She's rolling a sports ball around with her foot, making patterns in the weird blue snow. This stuff is different from snow on Earth, she tells you, because it isn't cold. But it's still neat. You can make stuff out of it. Your foggy head clears a little. Anemone is simple, physical, real. You always feel grounded near her. I mean, it's cool. I want to ask about the monsters. Nope, just some little bugs. The grown-ups would say if they were monsters, right? She shrugs and smiles reassuringly. Even if there were monsters, Chief Rhett would beat them all up, so don't worry. My mom says we're safer here than we were in space. You both look over at the wreckage of the stratospheric, the spaceship where you were born. Anemone's mom, Antecedent, is probably right about that. Look what the wormhole did to your ship. What are you making? Just snow spirals, she says. But earlier, me and Cal made a big snow pal. You missed it while you were sleeping in Medbay. She smiles her broad, gap tooth smile at you. Now that you're awake, we can play. Why aren't you in school? She smacks her forehead. School! I wondered where everyone was. I guess I'm going to be late for humanities class. She doesn't look very worried to you. It's okay, she says. Professor Hal is chill. He won't mind, but we should probably go now. She grins and starts running towards engineering. Hey, race you! No fair, she's getting a head start. She's a lot of fun. I've never, um, because I've never focused on sort of the combat and, and toughness side. I've only gotten to know her, uh, a little bit in my previous playthroughs, so I'm excited to, uh, to do a little more, uh, with an enemy, this one. So nothing to do with the garrison yet. Only schools and resting are unlocked at the moment. 
do a quick little run around, see if I've missed anything. Nope. Um, I think I'm going to take time to go to school. I only have half stress, so I think I can get a couple things in before I have to rest. Engineering. A low, throbbing noise comes from the engine room, which provides power to the colony. Other corridors lead off to the teaching labs in Medbay. You know the route to your classroom well, but the rest of this wing is off-limits to children. Congruence, the ship's onboard AI, beams down at you from a nearby hollow screen. Don't forget to study hard, Selene! Ah, uh, so do we want to study life sciences or humanities to start off with? Creativity and persuasion. A little persuasion. Biology and reasoning, which I have none of. I have to think about how I want to uh, approach this playthrough. Because I'm going to start working towards sort of toughness type things as well as exploration. Explore. Oh, I am being interrupted by my cat. Cat break. This is Taco. Named after the character from the Adventure Zone. He's very cute. And he constantly is getting in my face when I'm trying to do stuff on the computer. Aren't you? Are you going to sit there quietly? Or are you going to bug me? Undecided. Uh, I'll get a little bit of biology from exploring, but I won't get any reasoning. Do I need any reasoning this playthrough? I might go a low reasoning game. That might come back to bite me in the butt. Um... Well, I will want some biology to do some studying and stuff later to study the plants that I find, and that'll help with food issues since I didn't save hydroponics. I think I'm going for a low persuasion build, which is which is very much not what I normally would go for, but I've done high persuasion stuff before. I think it's not what I need right now, so I'm going to stick with the life sciences for the moment. Good afternoon, my burgeoning biologists and up-and-coming chemists. Professor Hal welcomes you back to your old classroom. This afternoon, we'll learn what I like to call the wet sciences. Phrasing. He gestures to his hollow projected lesson plan. Biology, chemistry, medicine, ecology, and geology. You'll learn a little bit of everything, with opportunities for further study in your favorite field. If you're looking for something a little drier, try registering for engineering classes. For today's lesson, Professor Howe tells you, we'll start with a fun group project. You'll be studying the mush tree, a prominent natural resource native to Vertumna. In the ideal conditions, it can grow at a speed of over a meter a day and have a diameter of up to 30 centimeters. He stands on his tiptoes and gestures to illustrate. Your team will experiment to find these, those ideal conditions. You're teamed up with Tang and Cal and are given a mush tree spore and a bucket to grow it in. The rest is up to you. Tang looks at up, looks up surveyor's notes on the hollow net. Mush trees, mush trees, she reads, are the most abundant south of the colony in the stormy, moist regions of the subaqueous swamp. What if we use water instead of soil, Cal suggests, like they do in hydroponics? Tang nods. If they like wet weather, that might work. Selene, do you have any suggestions? Uh, I don't think I've ever sort of gotten <laughs> this right, uh, if there is, if there is a right. Um, but if it grows in the stormy, moist regions, then it's probably not getting a lot of sun. Run an electric current through here, that's interesting. I've tried all of the above before, and it doesn't work, and you learn nothing because you didn't uh, limit your, your variables, which is good science consequences. Uh, but I know the snow is acidic. Um, which is, wait, P lower pH is basic, isn't it? Hmm. Uh, I'm going to try the electric current. What? Tang exclaims. Selene, how does that have any basis in reality? She looks to Cal for support, and he just shrugs, but he doesn't look convinced either. Neither understand why you'd want to electrocute a plant. You explain that there are storms in the swamp. Electrical storms. Maybe somehow that... Well... Maybe Selene is right. Tang nods slowly. It could make sense. And if it is true, we'd be the first ones to discover it. This is enough to entice Tang into most things. You attach a small battery and run a weak current through your bucket of water and drop the spore in. The next morning, your spore is the only one already growing. Aha! 
By the end of the day, it's already half a meter tall, and the day after that, it's so huge it hits the ceiling and you have to move it outside. Got some kudos, did some good things. Your tree outpaces all the others by a long shot. At the end of the week, Tang proudly displays an edit to the surveyor's hollow nut notes. Shows rapid growth when stimulated with a mild electric current, as discovered by our junior botanists. Huzzah. Now we get some card game. I find these are much easier early on in the game to get uh, to get the maximum because the, the equations for making them work are a little easier. Is that the best I can do? Probably. I'll take it. It is! Which is once you get lots of additional cards that do different things, uh, it can be complicated to try to figure out what's going to get you the most points. Great. Your parents have been working from first dawn to well after dinner every day. You know growing food is an important job and it's vital to get crops in the ground right away, but there seems to be something more than that. It's such a change from growing up in the stratospheric, when you saw them all the time. You stay up and wait for them at night before going to bed. Though you can tell they're exhausted, they make an effort to spend time with you. I'm sorry we haven't seen much of you, little gooseberry, your dad says. Your mom watches you as she works a pebble out of her gardening tiller, which also serves as a crutch. How have you been holding up? Alright, this is my first chance to get some delusions. This has all happened before. You tell them how you knew about the medallion your dad made before you saw it, because you dreamed about it when you were a kid. The more you speak, the harder it is to stop. You tell them about all the things you thought were just dreams, and how they've started to come true ever since you landed on Vertumna. You keep remembering stuff that's about to happen, and it's all so weird and confusing. Honey, your mom interrupts you. I know you've been under a lot of stress. We all have. She sighs and gives your dad a concerned look. He shrugs helplessly. I'm sorry we haven't been there for you, she continues, but is it possible you think you might be making this up to get attention? No, it's real, Mom. You try to stay calm and explain, but you keep talking faster and faster. Before long, your breath is coming in hiccups, and you start to cry uncontrollably. Your parents don't know what to say. All they can do is hold you tight and stroke your head. Of course they don't believe you. You can't think of a way to prove it to them. Taco, you need to not hit my second monitor and move things around on my desk, huh? I know you're very cute and just want attention. Very cute and just want attention. Say hi to the viewers. No? Okay. Bye! Of course they don't believe you, and you can't think of a way to prove it to them. When you've calmed down a bit, you hear them talking quietly to each other over your head. He did have a bad concussion. Maybe there was permanent damage. What if our baby... They look so anxious and pained now. We feel even worse than before. Okay, now I feel bad about this. But I'm gonna be... Forging on. They insist you go back to see Dr. Instance for a checkup and take you there immediately. You end up spending another month in medbay. Dr. Instance insists on giving you sleeping medicine that makes you drowsy, but at least you aren't just asleep the entire time like before. She takes a lot of health readings. You take notes, too, and learn a bit about medicine, because there's nothing else to do. It's boring and stressful at the same time. Your parents come to visit you in the evening, but nobody wants to talk about the dreams, or memories, or whatever they are, or were. You've been sleeping deeply with this medicine, so at least you haven't had that remembering feeling in a while. When you try to bring the subject up, Dr. Dr. Instance always says you should get some rest, and tells the med bed to give you more sleeping drugs. The days pass. Month passed. You feel trapped and helpless. Days blur into one another in a haze of sleep. In your lucid moments, you look longingly through the windows of the colony, bustling with the first excitement of life on a new planet. You realize that no one will believe you if you keep talking about living past lives. Or worse, you'll end up here again, wasting all your time sleeping. If you really are living this life over and over again, time is something you can't waste. You need to figure out what's happening. After a month of enforced rest, Dr. Instant says she can see nothing wrong with you, and that you must simply be feeling the effects of stress. You just need to take it easy, my little tomato, your dad tells you. Landing on Vertumna has been a big change for all of us. It's natural to feel anxious and act out. Your mom looks disappointed, but tells you she loves you. Can I just go home now? Instance looks up from her hollow palm when everyone turns to look at her. 
I don't see why not, she says, and goes back to her work. You know, says your dad, raising an eyebrow at your mom, I think there are lots of different ways to learn, and school is just one of them. You can learn from working on a hobby or by helping a friend. Your mom shakes her head and sighs, though you can tell she's trying to put on a gentle expression. We both agree that this colony is an experiment, and that means we're going to do things differently than on Earth. You're old enough now to start making your own decisions about your education and future. And if that means you find your own way, we'll accept that. Your dad puts a hand on your shoulder. We'll be proud of you no matter what you do. Try talking to your friends. They may have ideas for how you can spend your time. And come by Geoponics, your mom adds. We could use your help. The week, This week you had a few more bouts of deja vu, remembering what, what someone is about to say or do just before they do it. Sometimes they actually do it, but not always. This morning you were sure Professor Howe was going to trip on the uneven floor in the cafeteria and spill his plate of hash browns. We even told Mars to watch. He didn't, though. As Professor Howe walked away, his hash brown safe for today, Mars called you a liar and a dummy. At night, your dreams are all mixed up with stuff that you know can't be real. You're chased by monsters the size of buildings, only to be saved by strange people you've never met. You're holding hands with someone you love. You're crying as you help lift a shrouded body into the colony recycler. Everything seems so familiar, but when you try to recall their faces when you wake up, they're smeared in your memory like wet paint. You've lived this life before. In your dreams, you're sure of it. In the light of day, you try to remember everything from your dreams, but that's impossible. You can't live a lifetime in dreams. Anytime you try to tell someone they think you're playing a trick or that you're sick and need to go to medbay, you eventually decide to stay quiet about your strange dreams. Why? Because they're memories. You've lived it enough times to know. Over and over, your head is filled with memories. You've lived and died on this planet more times than you can count. Why are you stuck like this? Being stuck in a time loop would be even harder to explain than having prophetic dreams. It's the right choice to keep it to yourself. All right, so I missed a month and got more stressed. Interesting. Which is what I was sort of anticipating, I think, with this sort of delusions start, delusional start. Uh, it will make things a little more difficult if I don't have as much time to... Uh, to do activities and gain skills and whatnot, but here we are. Tang. Tangent is hunched over her hollow palm, frowning and poking angrily at the air. She speaks without looking up at you. Professor Howe wants us to prep a list of native flora with pictures. There should be a catalog on the colony holonet, but I can't find it anywhere. Let's do this one. Was that a joke? Um, well, it's not funny, Sulane. I need to finish this bio assignment so I can start in the engineering lab after lunch. And then I have a physics quiz, quiz to study for. She rolls her eyes. If you won't help, go kick a ball or something with the other kids. As you inch away, Tangent has already forgotten about you and is back to her hollow palm. Okay, so that didn't help at all. Anemone is bumping a sports ball with her wrists, trying to keep it in the air. Heads up, she shouts and bumps the ball in your direction. Think fast. Okay, I do not have any toughness yet. Let's bounce it back. Oh, that's a little toughness. You bounce the ball back and forth with her, trying to see how many times you can rally and keep it going. An enemy tells you about the new sports ball court. A proper, regulation-sized court, way bigger than the little zero-g one in the stratospheric. Her brother, Calm, is teaching the junior sports ball team this year. He's so great, she says. He's good at everything, especially spiking. He's coaching me to play awesome like him. You should come join us. Now I can do some sports ball, which I think I, I might, uh, might do some of that. Get my toughness up. Any hey, this anything... Oh, you found me. This is just better than you'd expect it to life on the surface. He's already found new places to hide and do whatever he does out here by himself. You see Tammy sitting quietly near the entrance to the lounge. You've known her for, well, your whole entire life. Back on the ship, you... Oh, I don't want to have teased her. We played together. Tammy had the best doll collection. After her mom died, her dad used all his nanoprinter creds to print her a different doll every month for a whole year. Her ears perk up when she sees you. Oh, hello, Sulane, she says. Her voice is soft and dreamy like a beam of starlight. Do you want to play dolls? Heck yes. More empathy. You don't think Tammy will ever be too old to play with dolls. If anything, she has even more of them now. She takes you to her quarters and brings out the entire... Spacey Stacy doll collection, a disturbingly realistic baby with real bowel movements, and two super fancy posable dolls named Lily and Tilly who can be programmed to move on their own. 
Tammy isn't very good at the programming, so Lily and Tilly just roll around awkwardly when you turn them on. You cover quickly by saying they must be breakdancing at a club. The two of you spend the afternoon making up stories of their rise to stardom as professional dancers. Cute. Mars, hey Mars. A sharp whistle interrupts your thoughts. Hey, Solane! Mars calls out to you. Come here, I have a job for you. You walk over to Mars, who's sheltering from the snow under the ship's overhang. It's so gross here, she complains. This spark snow would ruin my good clothes. At least on the ship we had climate control. Ugh! Tammy made me some soy sweets, but there's no way I'm going out there in all this weather, she continues. Since you like running around in it, could you fetch them for me? Yeah, sure. Good, Mars claps. She'll probably just She's probably just down the hill near her quarters. Mars sighs. She's scared to take more than a few steps from the door. All she wants to do is hide inside and make sweets. Doop, boop, boop, doop, boop. A little, a little fetch quest. Tammy is staring obliviously at the sky, smiling to herself. She startles as you approach. Oh, hello, Selene, she says, putting her hand to her chest. Do you need something? For Mars and Soy Sweets. Tammy smiles at you. Oh, it's so nice of you to help out Mars. She's a very important person, you know. Sure. She hands you a box wrapped in a pink and yellow scarf. One order of mango soy sweets made fresh this morning, she says. Please tell Mars that she can have the scarf back, okay? She used some of her kudos to nano printed for me because it's so dusty here, but I think I'm getting used to it now. Tammy smiles again and tucks her hair behind her big, elven ears. Mars is so cool, she says fondly. Sometimes she's kind of bossy, but I know she really cares, too. How insightful. And back to Mars. Mars puts her hand out expectantly. Give it here. I ate them. I don't think so. I want half. Sharing is caring. No, I have enough persuasion to ask for half. Um, yeah, I think she uh, she appreciates someone standing up to her. The audacity! She glares at you and you stare back defiantly. Ugh, okay, fine. She eventually relents with a small smile. You did fetch them and all. You split the box of soy sweets with Mars and sit to eat some with her. They're great. Tammy's a good baker, Mars sighs, but I wish she wasn't so scared of everything here. Sure, the weather is gross, but it's not dangerous. Oh, right. Administra Administrator Seek's looking for someone to do delivery jobs for the depot, she says. I don't want to do it, because, like, you running around out there? No. Just go through there, she says, gesturing to the door behind her. Tell them I referred you. Cool. Command. Command is a warren of long hallways with doors off to tiny nondescript offices. Every one you pass seems to be hurrying off to something important. Supply depot, general store, administration. Uh, I cannot apply to deliver supplies because I need either toughness or organizing, which I don't have yet. So that's fine. Lots more people to talk to, I guess, because some of them I was supposed to talk to last month and <laughs> didn't have the chance. You find your mum hard at work setting up the greenhouses with a small construction crew. You've seen these plans pinned to the wall of your family's quarters for years now. These geodesic domes will house the more delicate plants from Earth. Spinach, tomatoes, maybe even fruit. She takes a swig from her canteen as you approach. Looking for something to do, she asks. Remember, Selene, you're responsible for your own schedule now that we've landed. You can decide how to spend your time, so long as it's productive. She points towards the engineering wing in the back half of the stratospheric's severed frame. Professor Hal still is ex still expecting you in class, but a well-rounded education includes practical application. You're old enough to help with the work around here. She claps her hand on your shoulder. I've got another minute. Anything you need to know? Ah, uh, I don't think I know. Need to ask any of these? I'll ask about expeditions. Oh, you're too love young to leave the colony. It's dangerous. She shakes her head. Your father would be worried. Your father would be worried. There's so much we still don't know about the world out there. Let the adults find out, then maybe you can join them in a few years when you're older. She gives you a stern look. She isn't going to budge on this one. For now, stay inside the walls. Reading all of this is going to require some throat lubrication. Hello, my little potato, your dad exclaims, smiling warmly. What have you been up to today? Uh, what have I been up to today? Mostly hanging with my friends. That cow's a good boy, he says. And have you seen an enemy? Anemone? She's been out by the garrison playing sports ball. I think she spent every day outside since we landed. He chuckles to himself. Guess that's what happens when you've got enough brothers to make your own sports ball team. He breathes deeply and looks slowly around. Vertumen is magnificent, isn't it? 
You nod. Seasons, he shouts, throwing his hands wide. I missed seasons. Back on Earth, it got much, much colder, and the snow wasn't half as pretty as our spark snow. He sighs, stretching. You just wait until dust season. Both the suns will be high in the sky, and it'll be real hot then. You'll see. Dad's great. Cal is riding around the geoponics garden on his hoverboard. The board comes to a sudden, shuddering stop on the rocky ground in front of you. Cal falls off, but catches his balance before he eats dirt. Hi, Selene. Uh, wheel ground is way harder to hover on than ship floors. There are bumps everywhere. Uh, maybe they don't work outside. Oh, they totally do, Cal exclaims. I've been all over the place on this thing. Hovering outside is rad. Look at this. He runs over to a small depression in a nearby hill and presents it like it's something amazing. Look at this. It's a skate bowl. Yeah, I want to try. Sure, but uh, please be careful. Mom says if I break my hoverboard, we can't make another one. You take turns riding around the bowl, trying to get up enough speed, going down one side to come back up the other. You don't land any tricks. It's hard just staying on the board with this uneven ground, but it's still fun. Cal's adorable. I like Cal a lot. So, oh. no way you're going to let me out. I need bravery or toughness 20 to even ask. I'm afraid Expeditions is off limits for now. It's not safe out there for kids. You better toughen up so you can join the squad when you're older. Sure. Well, I guess I should toughen up then. Let's play some sports ball. Playing sports ball. Anemone meets you on the court. She's bouncing from one leg to the other in excitement. My brother Kama is organizing the youth team, she tells you. Kombucha offers you a high five and greeting, then tosses a sports ball your way. All of the names in this game are great. Let's start with a practice game to see what you're good at. You and Anemone are team captains. Pick your team! Anemone used to practice with Cal and Mars on the ship, but Tammy? You're surprised to see her here. Tom will fill in to even up the teams, but he promises to go easy on the other side. Uh, I could pick Kombucha, but that would be a little tough. I actually want to... I might choose Tammy. Make her feel good by being picked first. Cal said I could, I should join, but I'm not very good at sports. Where should I stand? She asks quietly. You, you aren't sure. You assign her to tackle back and tell her to stick like glue to the opposing team's offense. Maybe she'll get in their way instead of yours? Anemone chooses Kombucha, of course. They bump fists. Your next choice? Well, I'm going to pick Cal, because Cal and Tammy like each other. Mind if I play goalie, he asks? Sports ball is fun, but it feels mean to score against the other team. Oh, he's so adorable. You face off, three on three. Start the game, toughness challenge. Uh, nope, I like challenges just the way they are. Thank you very much. All right, this is a story challenge. All right, let's start with some basics. There's my delusions coming back to bite me a little. Um, won't be able to get any runs. So we'll go for the flush. I guess a couple flushes. Twelve. Okay, so that will become a three. Which again, oh, this might be tough. Huh. That's lower. So if I do this, then I get the run as well. There we go. Perfect. Tammy tackles an enemy in a brilliant takedown that surprises everyone. Go Tammy! She really took to her role as the immovable object. Cal makes an amazing jump save, but is winded when the ball hits him in the chest. The score is tied, with an enemy and Calm putting the pressure on. Then blam! You score the match point with a rad spike ball all the way from the net line. Nice. Well, that gives primarily bravery and a bit of toughness. Interesting. That's okay, I do need to get my bravery. I can get my bravery up to 20. 
But exploring is going to give me a lot of bravery on its own. I might go for more toughness by working on the farm rather than spending too much time playing sports ball. Though I do want to be friends with an enemy, so probably a, a solid mixture of the two. month into pollen season. So folks don't have a little dot dot dot. They don't typically have anything new to say, but sometimes you can get the uh, you can get your stats high enough, you can use some of those, but I don't know that I have. I guess empathy. I might be able to do that with Tammy. Oh, I have to have a break soon, of course. This is sitting in the grass near the big gates that lead up to the jungle. He's just staring out into nothingness and picking absent-mindedly at the weeds. He pretends not to notice as you approach. I'm just going to sit down with him. He likes his quiet. He shifts uncomfortably as you sit, but doesn't say anything. You both just hang out, saying and doing nothing. You stare out the big gates. The grass in the colony is trimmed short by garden bots, but out there it's wild and as high as your waist. Head Surveyor Tonin is prepping his equipment for an outing. He's bringing a lot. Maybe he's going to stay out overnight. You're starting to wonder if this will ever acknowledge you when he says, uh, I've got to go. As he starts down the hill, he pauses and says, This is a good spot. I'll probably come back here tomorrow. Tammy's dad is the head of ex Tammy's dad is the head of expeditions, which means he's out surveying the jungle every day. This morning you see her crying in the doorway as he leaves. I don't like when he goes out there. She sniffs after he has gone, but he's so brave, and so are you. That's why I like you, Selene. I have enough empathy to do this random act of kindness, which I will certainly do. You start simple. You give Tammy an enormous hug, sharing the love. Tammy gets a lot of hugs, but you make sure this one feels special. She hugs you back, wiggling back and forth happily. She's surprisingly strong. Thanks, Selene, she says breathlessly as you squeeze the wind out of her a little. I really, really needed that. Oh, before you go, she adds, and produces a box with a slice of cake in it from the folds of her skirt. Do you want this cake? They're so fun to make, but I need someone to help me eat them. I'll make you another on your birthday if you like, and we can trade hugs for cakes again. Nice, so I have a cake, which can be useful for giving as a gift to folks. Uh, in past games, I have largely figured out when everyone's birthday is. Early dust, where are we? Early pollen right now. Back. Late dust, late wet. They're twins, so also late wet. Early wet, late pollen is Tammy. So I'll save the cake for her for late pollen. And your early dust. So you'll be soon, because there's also an egg here for me to pick up, which I know Anemone likes, so I'll give that to her on her birthday. Uh, but I am way too stressed to do anything, so time for some rest. The Living Quarters. Everyone eats, uh, sleeps, eats, and hangs out. I'm going to relax in the lounge for the month. Hi, Taco. What you doing? Mischief? Just a little mischief? Looking for attention? The lounge is a long, well-lit hall along the outer hull of the ship's midsection. It's strewn with tables and cushions and serves as a communal living room for the tiny one-room spaces every final is assigned. You flop down into the lounge's big bean, big bean bag pile with some of the other kids. Cal has a dazed, peaceful look on his face. The air smells so good on Vertumna, and so does the dirt even. Hey, leave the tree alone. You know better than that, mischief boy. And so does the dirt, even. You notice his clothes are filthy, but obviously Cal couldn't care less. And then he bounces in. Holy crap! There's so much space to run around and play in! Crom and Chief Rhett set up an outdoor sports ball court, and it is way huger than the world one on the ship. 
Tangent carefully selects one cushion from the pile and perches on it. The school's expanding to some of the empty engineering bays, she tells you. We're getting a big new lab to do experiments using local resources. There's so much to learn about this planet. Anem Anemone rolls her eyes, but Tang continues. We shouldn't forget our studies just because we've landed, she says primly. Ooh. I think Tammy and, and Cal might, or uh, Anemone and, and Cal might like this one. I know dislikes this one. Uh, but I'm already, who am I friends with already? Pretty good friends with this already. I want to get my friendship with, with uh, Tammy up more too. Anemone, Cal, and Dis. So Lanus right, you hear over your shoulder, and you startle to find Dis standing right behind you. Gah, when did he get here? Did you see those huge beasts in the jungle as we were landing? Dis continues, picking out a thread on a sweater until it unravels. I wonder if there are more out there. You've had less of the deja vu, dreams come to life feeling this week, and you're starting to think you'd even imagined it. But suddenly you get a prickling sensation in the back of your neck, and remember that Mars is about to enter the lounge and tell everyone to look outside. You stare at the door. Mars walks through it as if on cue. O-M-G! Everybody, look outside! They're hoisting a flag over command, she says, clapping her hands excitedly. You know what that means, right? She stands tall with her hands on her hips. Vertumna is officially humanity's first exocolony. Ever! You look out at the flag, feeling dizzy, and silently mouth the words along to what she says next. You remember this moment so well. This is history, kids, she, explain she exclaims, wrapping anem anemone and tangent under each arm. And we were there. Very cool. Ah, uh, do I want to forget some cards? Yeah, let's get rid of some zeros. Optimize my deck a little bit more. You wake from an afternoon nap. This looks like a vision, huh? The dream you're in is one you've had many times. The air is strangely pink and fluffy, kind of sticky, and you have to push your way through it. it feels like every step takes an eternity. You push through the pink cloud and emerge into the children's crash, a room you know well, to see your friend Tammy standing before an enormous bear made of pure light. It lunges at her through her, and she collapses to the ground like a fainting fairy tale princess. You wake with your heart racing. Tammy is leaning over at you, where you've been sleeping in a nest of pillows. She shakes your shoulder gently. Oh, I'm sorry, Selene, she says, as if speaking to a small child. I I think you were having a nightmare. Are you okay? Are you? Nothing bad happened in the dream, but you feel sick with dread. Um, since you're awake, you should visit the cafeteria. Andy Seaton is making a new kind of candy. She says it's made of cotton. Isn't that weird? I have to go tidy the crush first, then I'll meet you there. Save some for me, okay? Tammy skips off towards the crèche, humming to herself. You feel groggy and need a minute to clear your head. That dream. Nope, gotta go save Tammy. Uh, this is a, a spoiler-filled uh, playthrough, as I mentioned up top, and as is in the title of the stream. Of course, on the very first playthrough of the game, you cannot save Tammy, and she dies early on, uh, which is such a... It was the first time I played through, it was this great early moment of, like, oh, okay, that's the kind of game that we're playing, huh? Uh, very, very sad moment, uh, but I was very excited to see what else would happen and, and what we'd be able to do in subsequent playthroughs. And, of course, now we can save Tammy. You sprint down the hall to the children's creche where the little kids play and learn during the day. It's empty. All the younger kids are probably off eating candy with antecedent. You spot Tammy tidying up some drawing supplies near the crafts bin. Above her, a hollow projector displays an enormous floating teddy bear made of purple light. It bobs silently in the air. Mr. Bearsworth, a decade of happy memories playing with it, flash through your mind in an instant. Tammy stands up on her toes and reaches for the switch to turn it off. You slam into her, knocking her off her feet onto the ground. At the same moment, the hollow projector sparks and explodes. The bear disappears and the whole room goes dark. Oh, poor Tammy. In the dim emergency lighting, you see Tammy's eyes wide with surprise and fear. She sits up and rubs her elbow, staring at you. Sorry, are you hurt? It's okay, she sniffles, looking like she might start crying. Why did you do that? Owie. I just saved your life! My life, she says. She peers into the dark room, looking even more frightened. How? You try to explain that the hollow projector was going to shock her, but she doesn't seem to understand. What? 
How? But it's Mr. Bearsworth, she says. It's just a toy. She doesn't believe you, but that's okay. You're just happy that you followed your dream and got here in time. You decide not to mention the dream, since she seems weirded out already. After a minute, the lights come back on. The projector is dead, a thin trickle of stinky smoke coming from the base. Don't worry, Tammy says, brightening as she gets to her feet. Professor Hal can fix it. He can fix anything. By the time you find the professor and finish cleaning up, you've forgotten all about the pink candy in the cafeteria. Saving Tammy. Mid Pollen. <laughs> Hello there. I did save Tammy. Thanks for thanks for joining. How how, how are you doing? Am I allowed to tell tell the the viewers who you are? So Lane, Tangent says, approaching you with purpose, we need to discuss my brother. You mean my buddy Dis? Dish. Yes, yes, Dis, she says impatiently. I need you to figure out where he's been disappearing. Ever since we landed, I barely see him anymore. He doesn't even come home at night sometimes, and I... She trails off and looks at her feet. <laughs> uh, our lovely chatter here is the main writer on on this game they are lovely and i'm excited for them to to check it out but yes i did save tammy welcome uh i'm doing i don't know if you've uh you've, you've seen much of it but I'm, I'm doing a weird run i'm gonna do some delusions and some combat and we'll see what happens a, a non-optimal run if you will Uh, I'm not very, on very good terms with my brother of late, but I, well, people are becoming worried. You get the feeling Tang is the one who's worried, but she doesn't want to admit it. I'll talk to him. He probably won't tell you, Tanyan says angrily. Newton's apple, she swears. He won't even talk to me anymore, she sighs. You may have to follow him. I would, but everyone in the lab would know I was gone. No one cares where he goes during the day. And there he is. What's up? You tell this that his sister Tangent wants to know where he's been disappearing off to. His eyes flit briefly to yours, then he stares vaguely off towards the engineering wing, where his sister is reading on her hollow palm between classes. He doesn't say anything. So this is why uh, I wanted to be friends with this early on, so that I could find out where he goes. Chaos reigns. Yeah, yeah, it's gonna be uh, uh, an interesting, an interesting run. I'm going to be interested to see how it, how it plays out, but I wanted to make friends with people that I haven't had a chance to make friends with before, see some parts of the game that I haven't seen before, and, uh, maybe craft a bit of an interesting, an interesting meta-narrative, uh, that I'm sure I'll get into as I, as I continue the playthrough. Where do you go, Dis? His eyes light up and he whispers, I bet you'd like it out there, Solane. He motions to the path, stretching away from the colony beyond the walls. I sneak out to go exploring sometimes. There's so much neat stuff. You just have to wait until the grown-ups aren't looking. It's small, so... I'm small, so it's easy. Just don't tell, okay? I don't want to get in trouble. You follow him down to a drain pipe, half-hidden behind the sports ball fields. Small kids like this could fit through it. Or you. Tangent will want to hear about this. Unlocked Sneak Out, which I love. One of the other things I'm I'm doing right now in this in this playthrough is uh, trying to take note of some of the things that I'm going to want to do in my uh, in, in in my in my best playthrough, my optimal run that I will do in the future, uh, where I try to get save everyone and get the best ending possible. We'll see how that goes. You tell Tangent you know where Dis has been going. You tell her he's been sneaking out to explore the jungle, not far away, but outside the walls. Tangle's concerned. Really? She says, wringing her hands. Is, is he... Is it safe? I'll keep him safe. She eyes you skeptically. Full offense, Solane, but you're just a kid, she replies. However, I suppose it's good to know he isn't alone out there. Good, good, good. 
Tammy. Tammy is sitting down in the grass with the baby on her lap. They're playing nicely with some flowers or a strand of the beads on Tammy's hair or something. Tammy keeps gently removing her hair from the baby's mouth. Oh, so lame, she giggles as you join her. Aren't babies the best? There are so many new babies in the crest. You'd think we were starting a colony or something, Tammy laughs. But the parents are too busy doing other work, and somebody needs to take care of the little ones. She looks down lovingly to the baby, who is now sucking on part of her skirt, getting it good and damp with baby drool. You could help too. It would be fun. Unlock babysitting. This is something that I definitely want to be able to unlock in the uh, in, in, in my later playthroughs. Looks like it's probably her 10 friendship event, perhaps. The baby chooses this moment to spit up a big puddle of pale yellow liquid onto Tammy's dress. Oopsie! Tammy coos and picks the baby up, and she holds them out towards you. Could you take them for a minute while I find a towel, Selene? The baby hiccups and rolls their eyes. They still look a little queasy to you. Ah, uh, yeah, I'll help out Tammy. Get her confidence. You hold the baby against your shoulder and pat their back the way you've seen parents do sometimes. They let out a satisfyingly loud belch and you feel a trickle of liquid run down your back. But you don't care. Because there's nothing better than that fresh baby smell. You decide you might take Tammy up on that babysitting job. So cute. This game is so cute. Y'all made a good game. Alright, so I still can't do delivery stuff. I need to get my toughness up. I did just unlock going outside. I might have to do that. I might have to do that. At the very least, want to... Uh, yeah, it's mid-pollen, yeah. Collect some uh, some collectibles so I have gifts to give to people. would be a nice, useful thing to have. Nope, nope. Keep exploring. Alrighty. All of this water to keep my throat e ready to uh, read things has made me have to pee. So I'm going to take a quick two minute break to do that. And then I will be back to explore outside the colony. But thank you everyone for, uh, for watching. And I'll be right back in, in just a sec. Be right back. I unmuted my mic, we'd be back. Hello, and we're back. Uh, we're into hour two of this stream. This is, uh, for those of you who are maybe weren't here at the beginning of the stream, uh, this is our new stream. My name is Lucas. I'm the studio director at Silver String Media. We're an indie games studio, uh, narrative design studio. We just released our first major in-house original project this year called Glitch Hikers, The Spaces Between. Um, and we decided we wanted to start doing some streaming occasionally and uh 
you know, just relax with some fun games, maybe sometimes play our own stuff, but sometimes playing other people's stuff or just hanging out, doing music. Um, we have a, a wonderful team with a, a variety of skills, so we'll see about, uh, you know, bringing some other folks on to, uh, to do stuff at various times. Uh, but right now, I am starting a new playthrough of I Was a Teenage Exocolonist, um, which is, uh, as I mentioned before, probably my favorite game of 2022 other than my own game, I suppose. Um, it's wonderful, it's a wonderful narrative experience, um, and uh, I love the writing very much, um, and it's just it's just really cool. So um, I've played through it a couple times before, and if you know I was a teenager, I was calling us at all, you know that that, uh, that changes things. Um, the, the replaying mechanic is sort of a built-in mechanic to the game. You have memories of past lives and it gives you various options and bonuses and things. So I am doing a playthrough that uh, I am planning on making it a, a more combat-focused uh, playthrough than I've done before um, in order to make friends with some characters that I haven't made friends with before and, and get to know their stories a bit more. Um, working towards a particular ending that we'll get to when we get there. Um, so it's going to be a bit of a spoilery stream because I'll probably be talking about stuff that has happened in uh, previous runs or will happen later in the game and things like that. So if you want to avoid spoilers for this wonderful game, which if you haven't played it and you want to play it, uh, totally understand. Please go out and get this game and try it out yourself. Uh, but otherwise, um, you have been warned and, and we're going to get back into it. So thanks for, for hanging out. Um, oh, and like I said, we're just starting this uh, this stream. We just sort of started this channel. Um, hello, first time chatter. Ryan Sanura, hello, welcome. Um, thank you for joining us. So uh, yeah, feel free to to chat, to uh, post any questions and stuff you have. I'm happy to, to talk while I, while I do this um, about whatever. Um, we are just getting started, like I mentioned, with this channel, so if you could hit that follow button, I'd super appreciate it. Um, and otherwise, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get into it. Uh, so I'm just now exploring for the very first time outside of the colony. And here is my good, my good friend Dis to speak to. You slipped through the drain pipe and out of the colony before anyone saw you. Anyone, that is, except for a dark form watching you from the trees nearby. Could that be... is that Dis? He turns and disappears into the jungle. Now you're sure of it. That was definitely Dis. He's not allowed outside the colony either. Just follow him. You scamper after him through the brush, heedless of branches and brambles scraping at your arms and legs. Without a proper Enviro suit, you get all scratched up. That kid, This kid is fast. You quickly lose sight of Dis and can't find his trail again, but you do learn something by trying. I love the exploration mechanic because it you go through a lot of stress in, in one month, but you can pick up a lot of skills as well in, the, in that amount of time. Uh, one of the things that I'm always trying to balance, having done this a few times, is uh, it can really increase a few skills a lot, especially perception, uh, especially bravery, a little bit of toughness, a little bit of animals. Um, and when I do a lot of exploration, I get to a point where I max those stats out pretty early on and then... I keep doing things that would improve those skills, and so it feels like sort of wasted skill upgrades. So I'm going to see if I can find some kind of balance uh, that makes that a little more uh, a little more balanced. Yes, I do words for a living. Your way is blocked by a strange small creature with one foot and four large eyes, two of which blink sideways on the top of its head like frog eyes. Oh, this must be a hop eye. You've heard people talk about them, but you've never seen one up close. It suddenly starts flailing around like there's something wrong with it, even though it was fine a second ago. It keeps pausing to look at you, then goes back to fl flailing. What is its deal? Let's do a little challenge. 27 gold. This might be a little tough, since I have no animals, but I have a decent deck. Let's see what happens. If I do this, I can get a good run to start with. I'll allow it. Uh, and there's my delusions. Um, can't guess we'll do something like that. We'll need the most points for that hand. So I'll 
it was easily be able to do this, so now it's just a challenge of can I max out my points on this last hand to get some bonus kudos. And I bet that big ol' run's gonna be better than trying to match up the zeros, and that it was the best score I could get. I love the card mechanic in this game, because it adds just enough gameplay uh, to keep it from being, you know, just a game about reading text and, and making text choices. Not that there's anything wrong with that, certainly. Uh, love a good narrative-based game, uh, but it helps keep it fresh, um, gives you something to do and something to think about and some strategizing and, and things like that uh, that I really appreciate. Got some animals and some perception. You stop trying to get past it and just listen. Oh, you can hear little squeaking noises from nearby. It's probably warning you away from its nest. You carefully avoid the nest while speaking in soothing tones. The agitated little guardian titters warnings at you, but eventually lets you by. Lots of stress for doing things, but a little bit lower thanks to... Thanks to... Something that I have. You leave the path and sneak through a strand of mush trees to one of the little sawmills dotting this area. It's a small but busy operation. Three people feeding mush tree logs into some kind of machine while a fourth one directs a four-legged robot with a plasma saw mounted on the front. Yeah, it's a good card. I will stay and watch what they're doing. You stay out of sight and watch how they do it. When one, one tree crashes down, it almost seems like the others are wincing. It's probably just your imagination, though. <laughs> or is it? They aren't planting new ones or leaving any behind. You know the mush trees regrow every year, but can they still regrow when you cut down everything like this? Hmm. Almost like it's a commentary on our own ecological situation. Even the smaller trees and bushes are getting ground up for mulch with a scary big grinder that sounds like a roaring beast. The entire process makes you uneasy, but also proud of how industrious your colony is. Somebody did follow. Thanks for the follow. Sigh. Hey, Sigh. Are you in the chat right now, Sai, or are you just follow elsewhere? You're strolling along the path when suddenly everything goes quiet. The wilderness is never quiet. There's always insect noises, the chirping of reptiles, even the wind in the trees has gone entirely silent. There's something unnatural about this place. Bravery! Right, another story challenge. Let's start with some zeros. Okay, this is pretty good. No runs there, but big flush. And that'll get me to the end for sure. So it's always how do I get the most out of this? Probably something like that. Yes. Good. You walk through the quiet area, the noise starts up again. The mystery will have to remain unsolved. Spooky. Still above 50, that's nice. Ahead of you, the road curves right, and there's a steep hill leading off to the left. You bet there's a really great view from the top of it, but it's going to be a scramble to get up there. Let's do it! You leave your pack and some bushes at the base so you'll be lighter on your feet, then start the trek. It's tiring and even steeper than it looked from the bottom, but some broad mushroom-capped trees provide shade. The view from the top is spectacular. You can see all the way to the colony walls in one direction, and down to a little sawmill in the other. Then you spot it. The rock. The most perfect boulder you've ever seen, teetering right on the edge of the slope you just climbed up. It's almost as tall as you are and must weigh at least 2,000 kilos. But it's practically teetering there. 
You think with enough muscle you could push it over. Well, I don't have enough muscle, which is good, because also it, I know that it's bad. Uh, so I will resist its temptations. Not today, Rock. Not today. Uh, there's usually some kind of pickup over here, but maybe not. I need to get my perception up so that I can see pickups easier. Early on in the game, it usually takes me... There's a mushwood log. It usually takes me a, a couple expeditions to clear all of the events uh, in a given area in a year. Um, later in the game, once you get things that get, keep your stress down uh, even more than it's possible to do everything in, in one go, which is, which is always fun. You let your mind wander as you're walking and bumble straight into a field of gelatinous blob grass. Gelatinous blob grass. Great. Totally transparent, the sticky fronds are hard to see, but even harder to ignore, especially once they start glomming onto your boots and slowing you down. Is that your technical term, glomming? It's like trudging through thick mud. You stubbornly decide to keep going, paying close attention to the visible signs of this blob grass field. And there aren't many, just an absence of other vegetation. Always take the challenges, always get your skills up. I don't know if that's the right strategy, but it's my strategy. Uh, oh, I can get another good run here. Set neighbors to this value, so that's going to give me a bunch of ones. Okay, again. That pair is probably better than the one flush I would get. I like that. Is it good? Yes, it's good. There it is. You can hop along from that rock to that fallen log, then climb over those old pieces of surveying equipment. You get through the villainous blob crass. You spend a bunch of time on it, though, and take some tricky balancing. It's tiring. Calm temperament is the perk that keeps me getting stressed. That's one of the reasons that I like taking that one early on. Oh, an egg. Always good to have. You come across a cluster of mush trees. They're not fully grown yet, but they're still pretty big. It might be good to harvest them before they get all gross and mushy during the rainy season. If you were older, you could probably cut them down and get some kudos for them. I'm going to give them a friendly pat. You like the mush trees. You give one a pat and are surprised when it moves under your hand. It's not the tree, though, but a camouflaged creature lying against the trunk. It's small and looks a little like an octopus or a starfish. Lots of long legs wrapped around the tree like it's giving it a hug. Cute. Or disturbing, but I'm going to go with cute. You're minding your own business when you stumble into... <gasps> this low valley has collected a lot of that thick pollen. You cough and try to push your way through it, but it's pollen all the way down. Surveyors get nice helmets with built-in... <laughs> uh, with built-in masks, but yours is just a cheap one. At least the pollen isn't too thick here. Wait, how do you say egg? <laughs> I know in sort of in the Michigan area my parents lived there for a while uh, it's it's less of an A sound and more of an actual E sound like egg uh, which is one of those is a subtle thing that is that is one of the reasons that people can always tell my parents were that people there could always tell that my parents were from Canada because uh, it was little, little things like that not an obvious accent but yeah, we're going to try to find our way through the pollen. Uh, I guess I can get a run. That'll be good. So that'll be a four. So we got a of fours once I put that up and then it's just a uh, run of wait a three of a kind of ones go yes Blah! this pollen makes your face itch it makes it all the better when you find a route to higher ground and come out of the worst of it My perception has gone up significantly since being out here 
this month, which is nice. More eggs. Oh, this is a good encounter. This will fix my stress problem. There in the clearing, the most majestic creature you've ever seen. It's like a unicorn from your dad's storybooks, but with leathery reptile skin that shines when the light hits it. It moves so softly like it doesn't even disturb the ground. It could be dangerous, but you want to see what it does. Oh, I see. <laughs> There's an egg! There's an egg! Get the egg! Rah, my egg. That's there. I won't get the run, but that's okay. I'll go for the pairs instead. Oh, that's a lot of zeros. Hmm. And then those are going to be ones anyway. Ah, much lower than I could have gone. As you settle in to watch it from behind a strand of mush trees, the Unisaur looks up towards you, startled by your movement. You try to hold perfectly still and quiet your breathing. Oh, and thanks for the follow, Neo Maruru. Appreciate it. Oops. After a tense moment, it goes back to its business. First, it sniffs out a good tree and rubs the scent glands in its neck against it thoroughly. Then it pees, like a crystal waterfall on a rock. Everything it does seems magical. Magical pee. You quietly take a picture with your hollow palm, but you know you can't share it. You'll, you'd get caught for sneaking out. Next, it sharpens its horn against a rock, which is scored with marks from having done this before. This must be its favorite sharpening rock. You notice the bulge in its stomach. It must have had a huge meal recently. Eventually, it curls up for a nap. You quietly sneak away. This was so wonderful, for Tumna is a magical place. Huh. Got rid of some of my stress, which means I can get maybe one more event in. In fact, I might do the end event here with this, now that I'm out here. I don't think I can get through there to get uh, any more pickups, so let's do this. You spot Dis standing in a clearing, but not before he sees you first. Instead of sneaking away as usual, he stays still as you approach, like it's totally natural that he'd be sitting in the middle of the jungle so far away from the colony walls. Now that you think about it, you're a little glad to see him. You are so far away that you can't see the walls anymore, and it's really weird out here. And it's getting late. Dis stares unblinkingly at you as you approach. Hi, Selene, is all he says. Hey, Dis. He seems to be in a good mood, something you see very rarely. Did you see Utopia out there? Dis asks. Chief Surveyor Tonin is easy to sneak past, but Utopia has, like, X-ray vision eyes or something. She'll catch you for sure if you get too close. She caught me once, and I got in big trouble. How about I show you something cool, and sneaking out will be our secret, okay? He jumps up and walks a little ways into the trees. You follow. Just a few minutes away, the ground drops off and a large stone outcropping juts out over a cliff face. Dis walks right to the edge without slowing. It's a long way down. Come on, he says. Let's be brave for Dis. Maybe go for the run to start with and get that... Minus one out of the way. Uh, now I can get the three fours and a flush. All right. So oh, that's going to be... Well, then I might use that to not go for the run and instead go for a whole bunch of ones in a row. Yes. Good score. Oh, that also reduced some stress. Maybe I will be able to keep exploring. That's perception. Beautiful vista. More friendship with this. You bravely step onto the rock and walk out to the edge with this. You both sit down, feet dangling over the precipice, and look out at the amazing view. It's incredible. You snap a picture with your hollow palm, but you won't share it on the net. This is your secret. Yours and Dis's. I like this a lot. So, I'll keep exploring. There's a log. At the top of, the, of a rise off to the east, you think you spot someone watching you. They're dressed in black. Is that Dis? 
but they look way too tall to be this. Maybe another surveyor? You blink and the figure is gone. Look for clues! You bushwhack down the valley and up the other path to where you thought you saw them standing. No signs of a camp or anything obvious like a dropped pack. No note saying, I'm watching you, signed a mysterious figure. Spooky. Spoopy! Plants grow fast during pollen. They've choked the path here and you can't see an obvious way through. Let's try for a non-obvious way through. That'll become four, so we can't get the run. Could get the run. Oops, that way. Interesting. better way I can do that. That's okay. Only the last round really counts, as long as I can win, which I will. Zero, one, two, four, four. Not getting any flushes, but oh, I do get better bonuses for straights, so I think that's probably the, the way to go. No, maybe not. Oh, thanks for joining while you could. Appreciate it. Uh, I'll probably be back next week doing more. And we'll, we'll see you soon, hopefully. You find a good stick and whack, whack, whack your way through the tangle of new growth. Take that, nature! A little more stressed. Oh, got another log. Excellent. Well, I've gotten almost all of the events. There's a couple over here that I'll have missed. That's okay. Oh, I do not have enough animals to deal with this float cow. A large woolly blue creature is floating here, a meter off the ground. It seems to be upside down, which is causing it some distress. Its segmented legs kick uselessly in the air as it tries to right itself. This must be a float cow. The colony is working on domesticating these, though you haven't seen one up close before. Her slitted eyes look at you imploringly. She makes a helpless, lowing noise and tries again to flip over, but she can't. Uh, I'm already, I think this makes me stressed, but I'm already going to be at full stress, so let's see what happens. Pop the float cow. There's nothing for it. You have to pop her dorsal bladder and let the liquid drain out or she'll never be able to flip over. She struggles and screams as you open your utility knife and jab it into her bladder. Immediately, you're drenched by a hot explosion of what you hope is milk. Gross, gross, gross! The float cow spirals away as you, as the sudden jettison of liquid propels her away from you. You hope she'll be okay? But you are decidedly not okay with how you smell now. Yep, time to go home. What a very productive month, I would say. Bravery up to 17, perception up to 25, which is great. And now I need rest again. But first, I believe it is Anemone's birthday? No, early dust. Whose birthday is it? It's Tammy's birthday. Late pollen. Do you have anything I can say? Nope, I'll save that for birthdays. Save that for birthdays. I always like to check to see if there's tasks and things I can do. Tammy's nose is as pink as her hair. She sneezes cutely into a handkerchief, her big eye ears twitching. I think I'm going to stay inside today. Maybe you should, too. Birthday cake for Tammy. A birthday cake! You remembered. She insists that you share it with her, but sets a large slice aside first. Cake is Cal's favorite food, she explains, so I always have to save him some. He loves cake all the time. Not just on birthdays. And, well, anything you can eat, really. Cute, cute, cute. Speaking of Cal, you're looking for Cal in the garden when you nearly trip over someone else. One of the younger kids in there... Blindfolded? Hey! They exclaim, ripping the blindfold off their face and throwing it to the ground. It's Cirrus, one of Anem Anemone's brothers. He glares at you. I was almost done! 
Cal jogs over and grabs Cirrus in a friendly headlock, ruffling his messy red hair. Dude, you were so close! Cirrus stamps his feet and complains that you got in his way. It's not his fault, Cal says. He didn't know we were playing the game. Give me a sec. I want to teach him how to play. Cal turns to you as Cirrus leaves. Sorry, Selene, he says sheepishly. I was teaching Cirrus a new game, but he's more like an enemy than I thought. Real competitive, you know? He stoops to pick up the blindfold, brushing off the dirt. I'm trying to come up with different kinds of games, other than sports ball, he says. No winners or losers. I just want to have fun with my friends. Cal looks at you hopefully. Do you want to learn how to play? Heck yes! Cal's smile looks like it's going to stretch right off of his face. Radical, he shouts, jumping up and down with excitement. Okay, so first, put on this blindfold. This blindfold is a little scratchy and smells like dirt. You can feel Cal's big hands on your shoulders. I'm going to spin you around. I'm going to let go. you got to listen to my instructions. We're going to walk all the way to the cafeteria, okay? You nod. You can't see Cal's grin, but you can hear it in his voice as he spins you around and counts to ten. One, two, three... First, Cal says, you gotta walk forward ten steps. Do you follow Cal's instructions as best you can, or make things difficult for him? I've done this before. In a dream, or another life, you smile to yourself. Between Cal's instructions and your memory, you make it all the way to the cafeteria with no problem at all. Ta-da! Cal exclaims, throwing his arms wide. We made it! Good job, us! He pushes open the doors to the cafeteria. You know, he says, you're the first person who's made it all the way to the end. We make a good team, Selene. Oops. You celebrate your joint victory by ordering two glasses of Otato juice and spend the rest of the afternoon brainstorming more games where there are no winners or losers. Cal is so impressed by how you somehow seem to know what he's thinking before he says it. Oops. Cute, cute, cute. Oh, hey, Dad. You meet your dad adjusting a watering pot in your mom's flower garden. He's having a sneezing fit, his eyes runny and red. You're alarmed. You've never seen him look sick before. People were hardly ever ill on the stratospheric, except sometimes on the zero-G rooms when it had been queasy. Not to worry, my little beanstalk, he says nasally. Oh, sorry. Not to worry, my little beanstalk. I'll be fine. It's just this pollen making my head a little stuffy. He wipes his nose with a handkerchief and looks around. Everywhere you turn, the air is soupy and tinged with pink from all the floating pollen. On Earth, your dad tells you, we used to call this hay fever. Even though it had nothing to do with hay... Your mom cuts in, carrying a large bouquet of flowers. The native flowers seem to be in full bloom this time of year. She buries her nose deep in them, and they smell fantastic. Your dad smiles kindly and agrees that they sure are beautiful. Then he blows his nose loudly. <laughs> they do smell good, and they look harmless. Your dad's eyes look so sad, but maybe that's just the allergies. Hey, Sulane, I know the last few weeks have been very hard for you. This might be a good time to relax and stick around in the quarter swing. I'm very stressed right now. Talk to Mars about... Nope. I think that's it. Let's do... A sleepy time! The ship's quarters are where everyone sleeps, eats, and hangs out. Yes, we're going to relax. You spot this listening to music and ask what band. He shares his playlist of something he calls post-post-punk mid-21st century. It's kind of whiny, but it sounds nice once you get used to it. Ah, uh, do I want to forget one of these? Yeah, probably. Early dust and I'm fully relaxed. And now I believe it is... An enemy's birthday, which it is. So I'm gonna go give her a present, and I know she likes eggs. On the ship, adults are always saying, No running, an enemy, no running! But outside, there's so much room! I can run for five minutes in one direction! Even more after the roboplows clear the land for farms. I think I first guessed that she liked eggs because the eggs were red and she was wearing red, and that was my only explanation. Well, thanks, and then we said, take the egg. I guess it is my birthday this week. I kind of forgot. Lots of good friendship with her. And that unlocked an event. So then I trapped it in my room, and an anemone says, telling you all about the bug she saw in her quarters. Its wings were as big as my hand and had feelers like, whoa! It was bouncing all over the place, like boing, boing, boing. She gestures excitedly, swinging her arms over her head. The bugs here are so big, they're everywhere! I was gonna give it to Tang, she says. She loves gross bug stuff. 
But she said I should just let it go, because if it stung me, I might get weird mutant powers. I mean, other than the one I already have. And I wanted to see if I got more weird mutant powers, so I started jumping around off higher and higher things until I was jumping off the back of the ship, and I got in so much trouble. But it wasn't even that high. She stops in her tracks. Hold on, she says, stooping to rub irritably at her knees for probably the hundredth time in the past five minutes. Arg! I'm gonna die! I busted up my knees and it's so itchy when my scales grow in. Annie, don't pick at it. Chief Steward Antecedent's voice rings out across the Grierson yard, pleasant but firm. It instantly transports you back to being in the ship crash, tugging on her skirts and calling her Auntie. An anemone jumps and stands up straight, her hands flying to her sides. But mom, an enemy whines, digging her fingers into her knees as Antecedent approaches you both. It's so scratch-tastically itchy! I know, lovely, Antecedent soothes her, patting down her riotous red hair. But the more you pick at it, the thicker your scales are going to grow in. An enemy tucks her hands under her armpits to keep from scratching. What if I want to have cool scales, she pouts. Antecedent smiles indulgently. At the rate you're going, I'm sure you'll be covered in them before you know it. No need to rush. Anemone's skin is dotted with patches of protective blue-green scales that grow in wherever she gets a cut or scrape. She rubs the patch on her jaw indignantly, the one she got when she ran headfirst into the food synthesizer back on the ship. Antecedent opens her satchel and pulls out a bundle of clothes. The queue for the nanoprinter is over a week long, so I patched your pants with scraps from your brother's clothing. Please try not to put any more holes in them. Or yourself, okay? She hands the clothes to an enemy. And ah, Man, I was doing so good! to Anemone and kisses her on her forehead. Anemone sticks out her tongue and gags. Yuck. Anemone evaluates the clothes as her mom walks away. Galactic, she breathes as she runs her fingers over the odd-colored patches. Then, right there in the middle of the yard, she unashamedly squirms out of her pants and pulls on the new ones. Wah! I look like a fighter jet from the hollows, she exclaims, showing off her new pants. Like when they'd stencil your kill count on your plane. Or like a really cool scar. Anemone grins. Yeah, you get it. My pants are scarred, just like me. Adorable. All of the kids are adorable. Your mom looks annoyed. Selene, she begins to sigh. I know he said you're mature enough to decide your own schedule now, but don't prove us wrong. If I find out you've just been playing hollow games in our quarters all day, I swear. <laughs> I wasn't. I spoke with your teacher, she speaks over you, raising her hand. Hal wants to see you in class more often, Selene. You can pick any subject, but I want you to study hard and try your best to excel at whatever you decide to do. This colony is too small to support layabouts and freeloaders. You try to swallow your frustration. Nothing good ever comes from arguing with your mom. Seems like a, a life lesson. Alrighty. So I'm all rested. I could do some school, but I think I want to work on getting my toughness up. How's my friendship? 11, 12 with Cal. I could also get my bravery up if I do sports ball. Uh, I want to at least help in the farm a little bit. Geoponics. The greenhouses have different biomes inside, growing plants from earth that might belong in a desert, jungle, or temperate forest. Some are so delicate you have to spray off any germs in an airlock before you can enter. In the seasonal garden's dry soil, tiny purple weeds sprout up from the cracks and wind their way around each other, suffocating one another in the attempt to gain higher ground. We're gonna shovel some dirt. It's your first day in the glorious world of agricultural soil conveyance. Oh boy! Good morning, Solane. Looks like you're working for your old lady. I hope you don't expect me to go easy on you just because you're my son. She walks you around the geoponics wing and points out where everything is. Your job is to move sod, compost, plants, garden waste, and equipment from one place to another. Get comfortable with this, she says, pushing a squeaky, old-fashioned wheelbarrow towards you. Now, any questions before you start moving that dirt? Don't we have machines for this? The construction crews already claimed all the hoverlifts, she says, shrugging. But they'll break down in a few years anyway, and we don't have the materials to fix them. She grips her forearm. We're planet side now. Use your muscles. Nature's hydraulic pistons. Uh, let's just get to work. That's my boy, your mom says, slapping you on the back. You stumble a little. Your arm starts to ache after the first half uh, after the first half hour of work, but you keep going. By the end of the month, you feel utterly drained and exhausted. And good somehow. You can feel your muscles growing already. 
shoveling dirt. Hmm. That is unfortunate with this hand of cards. Uh, we'll have to do something like that. Ah, I could have gotten one more. Five toughness, though. Hell yes. Oh, right. It's time for Vertinalia. Yudicott and the Council have called a festival to celebrate life here on the planet Vertumna. Everyone gathers in the colony square to hear Governor Yudicott's speech. In Earth's history, Yudicott begins and then clears her throat and waits for everyone to quiet down. <clears throat> in Earth's history, Vertumna was known as the god of seasons, change, gardens, and fruit. It's no coincidence that our forebears of the Vertumna project chose to take on such an auspicious name in the hopes of seeding future bountiful seasons of humanity. We will continue his tradition of Vertumnalia, a midsummer festival to celebrate our Vertumna, this lush planet upon which we find ourselves today. Uh, I'm leaning rebellious, but uh, I don't want to lean too rebellious on this playthrough, I think. So let's clap. I like you, God. Everyone cheers and applauds. The members of the council all get up on stage one at a time to give their own short speeches. Governor Uticott announces each one. Governor Uticott, command. Chief Administrator Seek, command. Security Chief Rhett, garrison. Chief Engineer Instance, engineering. Chief Cultivator Flulu, geoponics. Chief Steward Antecedent, quarters. Chief Surveyor Melatonin, expeditions. I love all of their names. When it's your mother Flulu's turn, she announces that tonight you'll be eating some of the very first crops grown from Vertumnin soil. Your eyes go to the feast table. Aboard the stratosphere, it would have been mostly soy-based food from the nanoprinters, spiced up with what precious fruits and vegetables could be grown in the small growing bays. This year, the earth plants look even less robust than usual, but they're supplemented by some vertumnin plants you've come to appreciate. Juicy watato pods and bobber fruits and slabs of edible fungi. Yudicott takes the stage after everyone on the council has said their piece. What is a festival without festivities, she asks. Professor Hal and Security Chief Rhett have organized a three-part competition for the kids. Good luck, children. Which one do you join? Oh, looks like I don't have a choice. Uh, I could just watch, but no, I don't want to get in there. Bot wrestling. A bot wrestling contest. This has been a classic competition for years on the ship. Someone has rigged up a hydraulic lifting bot to slowly stretch out, increasing in strength over time. The aim is to see how long you can hold it closed using any part of your body before it pops open. Anemone and Cal are competing with you. Cal doesn't like that it's a competition, but he does love bot wrestling. Wrestle that bot. Alrighty. Hmm, not a great start. If I do that, I get the flush. But I don't get as much of a run. I'm actually point. Okay, that is worth more. Be, that can be brought up to a zero. Does that help me? Probably not. That'll be, well, if I do that one, though, and then that, that, and that, I get a good straight. So I think I'll go that way. I need 12 more. Should be doable. Anemone's brother Calm is the judge and awards bonus points for technique as well as for brute strength. You sit on the hydraulic bot and use your weight at first, then switch to a bear hug when it starts to wobble and push you off the ground. You make it a full five minutes of increasing difficulty before it eventually springs from your grasp and scuttles into a corner, freed at last. You just barely edge out Anemone. She offers you her hand, then pulls it back at the last second before running away, cackling. Five-point red card, that'll be very useful. After the festivities are over, everyone takes time off for a much-needed break. During the fierce heat of dust, a few days rest is exactly what you need. You feel 
refreshed. All right. Oh, there's a log to pick up. Oh, and this has something to say. You slip through the colony gates, feeling the breeze from the mushroom forest ruffle your hair. You look around for Despot, he's nowhere to be seen. Maybe he went to class today? Probably not. As you're about to return to the colony, you hear what sounds like crying coming from one of the expedition vehicles. You pull back the tarp that keeps it from being blanketed with fungal spores and find Disc curled up in the cabin. He wipes his eyes and turns away. Go away, he mutters. Okay? Fine. Just, let's just leave me alone. Oh, I need persuasion for that. Oh, that's too bad. Do you want to talk about it? Why don't you go ask my sister, he mumbles. Tang is so mature. She knows everything. Just a sensitive little cryberry who doesn't know anything. Oh, poor baby. Dis wraps his arms around his legs and hides his face in his knees. I hate her, he mutters. Everyone thinks she's so smart, but she's just a big meanie. I hate everyone here. I hate being here. I just want to be left alone. He rubs his nose on his sleeve. Except for you, I guess. Sometimes it feels like you're the only person who's ever tried to be my friend. Poor Dis. I like Dis so much. I don't know what that says about me. Hi, Tammy. Tammy almost doesn't notice you approach. She's bent over her hollow palm, intently taking notes until you get close enough that her ears wiggle and she looks up, surprised. Oh, um, hello, Selene, she greets you cheerfully. I'm so sorry, I didn't see you there. You ask her what she's studying, and she flushes pink and tugs on her ear. Oh, uh, I'm not studying, she says. I'm making a list of my friend's favorite things. She laughs, a little embarrassed. And, well, you're my friend, Selene, so what's your favorite color? Uh, my favorite color is purple. She notes your answer, then asks what your favorite dessert is. This one's tough. I'm not a big dessert person, personally. But I think fresh fruit makes sense. Fresh fruit. Tammy carefully notes this as well. Okay, last question. What is your favorite toy? Uh, definitely stuffed animals. Okay, now I know what to get you for your birthday. What are your favorite things, Tammy? She presses her index fingers together shyly. Um, I like the color yellow. And my dolls. And my favorite sweet is cake. Adorable. I'm at max, or min stress, I guess. Zero stress right now. Shoveling dirt just gave, did give me a lot of toughness. I also want to get my bravery up. Kudos is doubled. 10% bonus to get a plus one. Kudos being doubled means I probably want to do some shuffling dirt because it gives lots of kudos. So that's what we're going to do. Tammy brings the crush kids by for a field trip to the gardens. Cal volunteers to show them around and play with the kids, leaving you to do all of the shoveling. He and the kids stomp everything into a nasty mud hole. Even when he gets in trouble, he doesn't seem to mind because he's still got to spend some time with Tammy. Cute. Oh, that's a plus two. That's a two right now. So again, not be gonna be able to get much of a run there, but I can get uh, a pair at least. Excellent. Lots of kudos. Lots of toughness. All good stuff. Late dust. Is that anyone's birthday or not yet? You were early dust. Yes, it is Cal's birthday, but I don't think I have any food. Cake, bobber fruits. Nope, just eggs and wood. I don't know if he likes eggs, but I think I want to save the eggs for anemone as much as possible, since... She's the main one that I want to make friends with this whole playthrough, because I've never gotten to max friendship with her. So I'll probably just give him a log. It's not um, anything special, but it'll still it's still good to give him something on his birthday to get those uh, those friendship points. 
Have you tried standing in mud yet, Kasu? It's the best, most amazing feeling I have ever felt. You look down, and sure enough, Cal's feet are bare and muddy as heck. Dirt and grass feel neat too, he continues. Sometimes the rocks hurt, but Mama says I'll build calluses. You should try it. Sure. Here's a stick. Cal accepts your gift with a genuine smile. Thanks for thinking of me on my birthday, Selene. So doesn't hate it. That's good. Doesn't love it, but better than nothing. Might just do a little more, uh, a little more dirt shoveling. Get that, get that toughness up a bit more. Get some more kudos in the bank. The greenhouses have different biomes inside, growing plants from earth that might belong in a desert, jungle, or temperate forest. I think we've seen this before. Let's shovel dirt. You and Cal... You join Cal at a particularly fragrant pile of compost. He's trying to use his hoverboard as a wheelbarrow, carefully pushing compost off it into the pile. Don't you just love this? Cal asks excitedly. Ah, uh, no, I don't want to say that. No, no, he laughs. I mean, just this... He waves his arms, dirt encrusted up to the elbows, to take in the entire greenhouse. We get to help plant. We get to help plant stuff and watch it grow, even if we're just moving dirt around. We're still helping. Why do you like it so much? Oh uh, well, he considers. I like digging holes in the dirt because it's so full of surprises down there. I found a worm. Wait, let me see if I can find her again. He sticks his hand into the compost and rummages around, his tongue sticking out of his mouth. I guess she got away. He says after a minute. She was real shiny, like a rainbow. Wait, he says. I just thought of a thing I like better. He shows you his splayed hand. Getting dirt under my fingernails, he laughs. I don't know why, but it's the best. Cal's great. They're all great. Oh, this is plus one to any card to the right. Interesting. A couple of those. Probably that. Nope, could have done one better. It's always one that I miss. So now I have... Got a log. Now I have 20 toughness. That might unlock some stuff. Because you... I am now tough enough. I'm tough enough to go exploring. Well, so you are, Uncle Tonin exclaims, standing back to admire you with pride. You know, I'd say you might be having a growth spurt, Selene. Then you better watch out for you on the sports ball field. Listen, he tells you, I can see that you're a tough cookie, and I'd love to have you on my surveyor team in the future. But you'll have to wait a few more years for us. Come see me when you're older, okay, kiddo? Dejected, you drag your feet as you walk back through the gates to safety. Well, there is still just a secret way out through drain pipe near the garrison. If the adults won't let you visit the Valley of Vertigo or the subaqueous swamps or the other cool places other surveyors get to go yet, you can still sneak out through there to explore just outside the colony walls. Anemone is running around the sports ball court, touching her hand to the ground at each corner. 18, she counts. 19! When she reaches 20, she collapses into the grass and checks her hollow palm. I'm training, she explains. My big bro Com says I have to get my legs climatized to the planet if I'm going to be team captain like him. Excellent. I want to train together. I now have enough toughness to do this. Telling a violent tale. Ooh, good red, but bad for yellow. On your way to the sports ball pitch, Anemone shares the story about the time her brother Com once spiked the ball so hard that he broke Utopia's nose back when she used to play sports ball too. She describes it in gory detail. But don't go easy on me, she exclaims. That's why we have medbeds, right? Plus, I might get a cool scar. She thumbs a blue-scaled scar, her jaw right under her ear. Cool. Give me a little extra toughness. Friendship points and all that. Uh, it is early wet, I believe. Is that their birthday? No, they're late wet, so I believe it's Mars's birthday. Yes. But she dislikes logs, and I don't have the things that she likes. So her I might have to give an egg to. Hello, Mars. I have all these kudos and nowhere to spend them yet. Seek says the depot store won't be open until next year. How am I supposed to show off how much better and harder working I am than everyone else? That's one way to approach it. Oh, she doesn't like eggs either! Well, so much for that. 
outside in the dirt. What a waste of an egg. Oh well. Now I know more information. Mars doesn't like eggs. Let's play some sports ball. Play sports ball! You're paired with Nougat in practice. You make the mistake of underestimating her, and she wipes the pitch with you. Playing sports ball. So I can get a straight. I do get bonuses to straights. So that probably... Oh, actually, that's a big straight. Because I have that, and it gives me a little bit of a flush. It's probably the best I can do. Yes. Four bravery, one toughness. That gets my bravery above 20. That's great. A little bit of kudos, a little bit of stress. Oh no, you're having a terrifying familiar dream. A monster crashing through the walls, unfathomably large, each, every part of it wriggling and moving and searching for something. It tramples through the colony as you watch helplessly. Time shifts to the wreckage of your home. You're picking through it, looking for something tears streaking down your dust-covered face as you lift heavy pieces of debris, searching. You wake up, shouting, No! But your voice is drowned out by a deafening rumble from the skies over outside. The bedroom window is covered in... Water? It's pouring down from the clouds. You guess this must be rain, but you've never experienced it before. There's a bright flash from outside with another crack and rumble. Thunder! It must be a thunderstorm! It's still the early hours of the morning. You've already almost forgotten about your bad dream, but you're too unsettled to go back to sleep yet. The rain beats down on the roof of your quarters, joined now and then with great peals of thunder like the footsteps of an angry beast. I'm heading out to play in the rain. I used to live in Ontario where they had thunderstorms in the summer uh, quite a bit, summer and fall. And, uh, now I live in Vancouver where we very, very rarely get a thunderstorm, and it is basically the only thing I miss about Ontario. It's surprisingly warm outside, and the water feels nice hitting your head. Everything smells fresh and damp and wonderful, and the dusty, packed ground has turned to squelchy mud between your toes. You don't go too far from the door to your quarters, but it's exciting being outside in the dark, watching dramatic streaks of lightning arc down to the hills behind the colony. Tinted wet. Love me some rain. So, how am I going to spend the last couple months here? I'm okay on stress. I'm missing one collectible and three events outside. Do I do one more exploration? Or do I stay inside and do some more... Do some more sports ball. I'm probably good on those right now. <laughs> Maybe you should go to school for a bit. Or babysit. Got my empathy up a bit higher. Is that 22 unmodified? I start getting things to the 33 mark, I also start unlocking special bonuses. I don't want to overdo it too much in one in one direction too quickly. Yeah, I think. Reasoning and organizing are never going to get high this playthrough. Might get a little biology and engineering. I'll get engineering from exploring later, especially. So I might do a, put a little bit of time into biology and, and engineering. There's no combat training yet. No animals yet. Ah, uh, let's do some. Reasoning five to register for engineering classes. This will give me one. Tang is absent almost all of this month. Hal explains that Chief Engineer Instance has asked for Tang's help with a few experiments. 
Because you're judged on what you know, not what you prove you've learned in class, many older students choose to skip class and instead get hands-on experience in their field of interest. Tang's been working closely with him since he was just a kid. Wow, imagine a school was like that and not just wrote studying and preparing people to work factory jobs. Uh, so that'll then be a four... Sixteen, is that more? No, that's the best. I think that's the best I can do. No, again, always the one point away. I never, I never spend that extra couple minutes to really figure it out. But that's okay. It's only a kudos lost. Late wet. All right, well, now it is Tang and Dis's birthdays. I don't have the things that they like. Do have sticks? Maybe they'll like some sticks. Better than nothing. Tangent is watching a construction crew build scaffolding for the new engineering pavilion. They're using mush wood, which is so light that one person can easily lift a ten-meter-long pole and stack it into place. She points towards them. Human beings are so great, don't you think? Before we landed, this was all just dirty jungle. Now it's civilization. I've been learning about adaptability and writing in biology class. The books says the books say. It's what sets us apart from the animals. Like, we don't need fur because we can make warm clothes, and if it's too hot, we can make air conditioners instead. I don't think she likes if I go this direction, and I can't go that direction, so totally. Whatever you say, Tang. Little, little human supremacist of you, but we'll see how that goes. Tangent nods absently, lost in her own thoughts. Humans are some of the only animals native to Earth that can sweat. I wonder, it seems so much warmer here than on Earth. Have the animals here developed the, capacity, the capability to sweat, or have they adapted to the heat in some other way? Together, you watch as the foreman puts the blueprints for the scaffolding onto the floating screen of her hollow palm and raises it to the scaffolding to check the progress. I'd like to see an alien do that, Tang says primly. Humans look defenseless and weak, but we're the strongest species in the galaxy. Who else can literally bend reality to their will? Not a stupid alien, that's for sure. She puts one finger to her chin. I'm living proof that humanity is greater than our biology, she says. All of us are, really, with our genetic enhancements. We're the next step in humanity's evolution from great ape to galactic super species. That's an opinion. Oh, my bravery is high enough to do this too. Dare you to eat this worm? Oh yeah, discounters? Well, I double dare you to eat a worm. You can't just turn down a double dare. You're no meek little hop eye. Slimy, unsatisfying, very, very gross. Dis eats his like a noodle, slurping it up and wrinkling his nose as it wriggles into his mouth. Yuck, he says, swallowing it whole, then shows you his empty mouth. You should have known better than to dare a person who fears nothing. Oh, wait, it's your birthday. Let's give you a gift. A stick. Is it my birthday? I almost forgot. I hate it when people make a big deal about my birthday, but this is nice. Um, thank you. And you. Have a stick. Tang is surprised that you remembered her birthday. She looks dubiously at the gift for a moment, then smiles at you. You didn't have to, but thank you, Soleil. I'm glad you liked a stick. Almost at the end of the year here. I do think I'm going to do one last expedition out. Let's see if I can get those last few events and the last collectible to pick up. You stop for lunch eating an earth treat grown from your own greenhouses. A watermelon, nice and sweet like a more solid otato pod. You munch away, spitting out the seeds. Uh, so I could get some stress back by doing this. Also, I know that um, some people get mad if you spit out seeds while you're doing this, but I also know that this gives me some combat bonus, and I don't really need the stress. So uh, for this playthrough, I wouldn't do this in other playthroughs, but for this one, I'm going to practice spitting seeds. There's the egg. Excellent. 
Let's get another egg. A stream cuts through the path here. There must usually be stepping stones across it, but the water's too high to cross safely. Jump. Small flush. Um, 18 or 19. There we go. That is better. Excellent. That was the one point that I usually miss. Plus one bravery, plus one kudos. You bravely fall in and get wet. You flounder towards the other side, soaked but victorious. I think this is the only event left here. I'm talking to Tonin. You spot Uncle Tonin, Chief, Surveyor Tonin, that is, bubbling about, preparing some automated survey equipment in a clearing. He's very cautious, jumpy even, but he's making a lot of noise. Every few minutes, he'll pause to listen and check his surroundings, then go back to banging away. He shouldn't be hard to avoid if you don't want to get caught sneaking out. Get some perception. Run in there. Huh, already won. So now it's just a question of can I get the max points for this round? And I think there's no run to be had there, so that's probably the best I can do. Yes. You sneak past Chief Surveyor Tonin easily, walking walking while he makes noise and ducking down when he stops to check his surroundings. My perception's getting pretty high, damn too. Um, so I think that was the last one out here. I'm just going to double check. What time is it? 10 after 5. I'll finish up this year, I think. Crawl through the big drainage pipe behind the sports ball pitch, carefully sliding the mill grate back into place behind you. Then carefully check that the coast is clear. Good thing, too, because Uncle Tony is passing by on his way to the garrison. You curl up in the shadows and wait for him to leave. That was close. Bravery, some more perception. The days have been getting shorter, with only the yellow sun barely skimming the horizon. One morning, you wake in the darkness and have to check your hollow palm to know what time it is. You see a hollow stream from Mars. Good morning to all my pals. You can even call it, if you can even call it morning, they've named it Glow Season because, like, everything is crazy glowing out there in the dark. I am staying the heck inside for the next month. What's the point of even going out if you can't see anything? It's going to be a long, boring month. Ah, it looks hella cool out there. You peek out the window. The wormhole is the biggest you've ever seen it, like a massive fiery ring in the sky. The planet must be very close to it now. And out in the jungle, something new is taking place. The plants are flowering, glowing, iridescent blooms, and everything is full of life. There are strange new sounds, long hooting calls, and gurgling roars. After Mars's message is a notice from the council, warning everyone to stay safe inside. Tammy's dad and the other surveyors have been called back, and the gates closed for the month. There's a tension in the air, as if everyone is waiting for something. Welcome to First Glow. It does look very cool, I will say. You're hanging out. Mom's hanging out. I'm going to school. All right. So you walk away and are just out of earshot. You hear Uncle Stars. It is beautiful, though. See? 
even mom agrees. Only a couple people out and about though. Oh, got a crystal. Excellent. Dis is enjoying it. Feels different, he mumbles. Do you know how? Just different. You ask him what he means, but he just shakes his head and stuffs his hands in his pockets. Alright, last thing for the year. I think I'll probably do another... Another school. This week in biology class, you're learning about predators and prey. Professor Hal brings a picture of a hot eye on the hollow projector and asks, Who can tell me what special thing hot eyes do when they see a predator? Tang's hand shoots up. They hop away very quickly. That's why we call it a hot eye. Hal nods. That's true, but not what I was getting at. Tang stammers and looks upset like she can't believe she got something wrong. Hal scans the class again. Anyone else? Salame? They thump on the ground to warn others. You've seen hot bites out of the wild, and you know they're very communal animals. One wouldn't run away without warning the others first. Then they all hop away very quickly. That's right, Hal smiles. Selene sounds like you might have met one before. Tang gives you an appraising look. Maybe she didn't expect this from you. I like that you get some unexpected reactions from them. Mars likes when you stand up to her. Tang likes when you, you know, are, are smart. Oops. Okay, so the question is... I guess that will count as yellow, so that'll definitely be the better option. Excellent. Four biology, one reasoning. And now, the end of the first year. The endless dark of glow season must be getting to you. All week you've been having nightmares. Something is coming. Something bad is about to happen. A dreadful mantra repeats in your head. It's a lot of stress. You're hardly even surprised when the emergency sirens start up. You peek out of the gates. Yes, they should be closed, but they're open, just as you dreamed or remembered, but the details are foggy. There were monsters. The closest assembly point is the children's crash, but from the opposite direction, you hear shouting and loud popping noises. Gunfire? Is the colony under attack? All right, so this one, I have played it both ways before, but this, this run, I'm definitely heading out to join the fight. Uh, more stress, not that I could take more stress. You'll try your best to be brave and fight back. First you dodge some helpful grown-ups who point you back to the crash, then you head outside just to get your bearings. You can hear yelling from up the stairs to command and a commotion to the southeast at Geoponics, where your parents are working. Go to Geoponics! My poor parents! Your parents are defending the greenhouses from a pack of knee-high creatures which seem to have eyes growing all over their bodies. Their oily flesh ripples with a constant subtle motion as the individual eyes blink one at a time incessantly. You can't tell which end is which with these horrible things. This feels familiar. Cal is standing nearby. Wide-eyed, he slowly picks up a shovel and moves beside you. He reluctantly holds the shovel in front of himself like a weapon. Easy doggies, he whispers. We don't want to hurt you. Get out of here, both of you! Run! Your mum shouts, attracting the pack's attention. In a flash of remembering, you lock eyes on one of the creatures. You've done this before. You know it's frightened. You know it's going to attack. And you know what to do. Soothe the beast. Thank you, my past memories. You shout, don't look at their eyes, and cover your face with your hands. You hear the eye beast lunge towards you, then stop. Cal whimpers beside you as it sniffs your shirt and paws at the ground. Your heart is beating so hard, but you stand still. You aren't sure you could run if you wanted to. Then, slowly, the pack filters out of the greenhouse. You peek through your fingers. It's as if they're anxiously looking for something. Cal and your parents are incredibly relieved. You hear another crack of gunfire from the other side of the colony, then silence. After two weeks of darkness, with the blue sun barely skimming the horizon, it begins to move higher in the sky, and daytime returns. The council admits they don't know how the gates were opened, or how the creatures got in. Some of the attacking creatures were once thought to be docile, others were species nobody had seen before. It was like something had driven them to assault the colony. At least nobody was killed, this time. And that is the end of year one. Got some good friendships going. Mostly all the ones that I wanted to do. Need to keep doing more of Anemone. Toughness, perception, bravery, those are always going to be high. 
Uh, for me, I think, especially perception and bravery go up a lot when you do exploration stuff. Uh, <laughs> just about equaled out my rebellion and loyalty. Oh well. Start age 11. And that, with that, after my first year, I think I am going to end this wonderful stream. Let's see here. Switch over to there. Thank you, everyone, for, for coming to check out this, our very first uh, Silver String Media stream. If you weren't uh, here at the beginning or at the halfway point, um, we are a small indie narrative studio. Uh, we made a game this year called Glitch Hikers The Spaces Between, which came out on March 31st for PC, Mac, and Nintendo Switch. Um, check it out if you're interested in what we do. Uh, if you looked at the About section of our page here on Twitch, um, we have a whole list of some of the other games that we do, uh, links to our Twitter and website and, and all of that fun stuff, so please do check that out. Um, I'm the studio director at, at Silver String here, and, and we've decided that we want to start getting into streaming, or at least checking it out as a way to uh, you know connect with our community and have a little fun and check out some other narrative games that we didn't make, though we'll also you know, maybe play some games that uh, we made as well, do some playthroughs of Glitch Hikers at some point. Um, while you're here, if you haven't yet, would love if you hit that follow button. We're just starting this channel, so, you know, trying to grow it as, as much as possible, obviously. Um, like I say, check out our uh, other projects. Um, if you're interested in other stuff that I do, I also had a, a novel that I got published this year called The Clockwork Empire. It is about a found family of disabled queer folks coming together to fight fascism in an alt-history Earth steampunk where the Roman Empire never fell. Uh, so if that sounds interesting, check out The Clockwork Empire. It's available on all major online stores. And this month for all of November, ebooks are on sale for like less than half price. So um, go check that out if that sounds interesting to you. Shameless self-promotion in there at the end. Uh, otherwise, thank you so much for, for hanging out. Um, I'm thinking that we'll probably We'll be figuring out what sort of a regular schedule looks like for, for us and if other team members are going to come in and do some stuff. Um, right now, I'm thinking I'll probably continue this Exocolonist play on Friday afternoons, um, like, like today. So um, if you're interested, come back next week. Hopefully we'll be, we'll be doing it again. But otherwise, thank you so much for coming and, and watching and hopefully to see you next week. Thanks a lot, everyone. Bye.